Drums keep pounding a rhythm to the brain. La da 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 dee. La da 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 da. Charleston was once the rage of home. History has turned a page of home. The men escort the current thing. Beat goes on. The drums keep pounding a rhythm to the brain. La da 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 dee. La da 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 da. The grocery store, the supermodel. Still keep on marching off to war. Electrically, they keep a baseball score. And the beat goes on. The beat goes on. Drums keep pounding a rhythm to the brain. La da 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 dee, la da 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 da. Grandma's sitting chairs and reminisces. Boys keep chasing girls to get a kiss. The cars keep a going faster all the time. Goes on. The beat goes on. Drums keep pounding a rhythm to the brain. La da 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 dee. La da 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 da. And the beat goes on. Yes, the beat goes on. And the beat goes on. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to introduce you to your host for today, Ron Burbaum, President and CEO of Pear Tree Canada. With an extensive background in law, tax, and finance, Ron has blended his proven talent for recognizing, structuring, and implementing innovative yet conservative financing structures with a sincere lifelong dedication in supporting philanthropic causes. Ron, I'd like now like to turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. This is obviously of great importance. We have 800 registrants for this morning's seminar. Uh, thank you for uh, thank all for joining us on federal budget and changes in these rules earlier in the year uh, being recorded will be available on our website within a few days of both, with both English and French closed captioning. We'll also welcome questions, uh, which we may be able to answer today or by email. Firstly, let me allay some common concerns. The AMT rule changes, even if not rolled back in whole or in part, do not result in the end of charitable giving, nor does it result in the end of flow through share financings. And nor what does it result in the end of the combination of these two well-established tax incentives in the pear tree offerings, which simultaneously enable increased giving and in increased exploration job creation. Under the new rules, individuals will need about one and a half times more taxable income to maintain their current level of philanthropy and flow through share investment. Otherwise stated, all other factors being equal, we may see a reduction in resource investment and donations in the flow, in the flow through 
share format of about a third. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide real life common examples as we unpack the differences between the current tax regime and what happens in 2024. It is our hope that once participants understand the impacts that we get over our um, Canadian complacency, pick up a phone, a pen, a keyboard, <laughs> a pitchfork, and contact our members of parliament in the hope of moderating the rules or delaying implementation until the politicians understand what's at stake. A few comments before introducing the panelists. For those in the resource sector, the examples are all geared for donation. But most of our time this morning will be policy discussions which apply to both sectors. The information enabling reaching out to the politicians is of equal value. The conversations today are directional. They're not technical. For those in the resource sector, you may wish to visit our website and reference a Northern Minor article we sponsored focused entirely on AMT rule changes in exploration, as well as a 10 minute podcast along the same lines. Moreover, for very specific recommendations, you can also refer to our September 8 submissions to finance, recommending legislative carve out to AMT as it relates to the flow through share regime. That submission may not be posted quite yet. And if it's easier, simply email us for a copy and we're happy to provide it and help assist you in, in speaking with government. And lastly, for the resource sector, please diarize October 17 for a webinar we are sponsoring moderated by Lisa Davis, who heads up Pear Tree Securities and spent six years on the board of directors of PDAC, five of which as co-head of the Finance and Taxation Committee on which she still serves. Uh, joining her will be Kevin Chan at PWC and Sandra Greve from Bennett Jones. AMT impacts will be on one of a number of topics that are timely. Stay tuned for details. That's October 17, 1030 is our usual time slot. We're fortunate today to have three panelists of overlapping um, appreciation and understanding of broad tax policy with focus on philanthropy and with very different career paths and insight into AMT rule changes. Uh, Robert, otherwise known as Bobby Kleiman, who's a chartered accountant by profession and who spent the better part of two decades heading the Montreal Jewish Community Foundation, building it from about $100 million under management to $2 billion serving Quebec donors across the province and across all ethnic and cultural communities. Since his retirement a couple of years ago, Bobby spends his days with charities and donors, helping them raise and raise more, give more in tax efficient ways. Tony, uh, Troy, sorry, Troy McEachran is, is, a, is, is a partner at Miller Thompson in the Montreal office, specializing in tax, trusts, estates, and philanthropy, cited in Canada's best lawyers uh, in, in all of these specialties in all of the past 10 years, recipient of numerous professional accolades, has authored dozens of articles and uh, holds a TEP a designation. If you go to the Miller Thompson website and look under his name, you'll find a long list of interesting stuff for those who are interested in tax, philanthropy, giving structures. Uh, Bobby and Troy will each present for about 12 minutes, at which point we'll, we, we will all have a pretty good understanding of the AMT impacts, after which the fun begins with a fireside chat about tax policy under the general heading of what were they thinking? Uh, with Brian Ernawine, who before joining KPNG after retiring from government, spent 35 years with the federal government's finance tax branch, serving as general director of tax policy. Brian also held several uh, leadership roles within the tax legislative division, legislation division rather, um, including assistant deputy minister, director and chief uh, and seniors chief. And with that, let me turn it over to Bobby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron, and a pleasure to be here again. Um, so uh, I'm going to go right in. My job is to give you some examples of uh, how this will affect philanthropy and donors. Um, and so we start with this, um, I guess, yes, um, with an examination of four uh, people, we call them the four horsemen of the uh, of, of the apocalypse. We'll talk about a fifth one as well. And the first one is a techie. Um, uh, real story, uh, met this person um, uh, probably about three weeks ago. Um, and um, this techie is, uh, is being bought out uh, for some of his shares of his public company that they've developed. 
and um, and uh, has met to look at he wants to do philanthropy as as a result of that. Um, let's go forward. Uh, let's go forward in the slide. Okay, so just to set him up, uh, his gain is ten million. Actual one is Murr. He wishes to donate three million of securities before the sale. Actually, a little bit more. Um, other facts, just to set a uh, standard, 400,000 of salary, has 20,000 of interest expense on his return and 25,000 of other donations. Okay. So in the, in the new AMT rules, okay, uh, in, in 2023, if he does this and it's scheduled to happen in November, so it will be fine for AMT, there'll be no alternative minimum tax. In other words, he will get his full deduction for the charity he is his the three million dollars to securities will continue to be have no gain and no tax on the gain on that, that uh, with that incentive and the receipt get full value of the receipt no amt issues if this is delayed into 2024 which it might be um the net change is because of the changes to amt uh which troy will go through in detail he will have $906,485 of alternative minimum tax to pay. That's just the federal one. Next slide. The federal one. Um, then, of course, there's the provincial component. Uh, the numbers that I'm showing here is really the federal numbers. Obviously, each province has different percentages and whatever, so it's hard to, to exactly give the, the, the number to comment. Um, um, so, so this person will probably have about a million and a half of um, of, um, of AMT to pay. Uh, under the AMT rules, you can recover it over the following seven years. Will we be able to recover a million and a half dollars uh, based on his tax returns? He'll recover half of it or, uh, or some other period, but he'll lose out on the balance. Uh, next example. Um, someone who's selling their company it says real estate company it's not about real estate it could be any company and it's a, a sale in this case selling her company to a reap and um, and, um uh, and has a 40 million dollar capital gain and wants to make a gift to a university of 10 million dollars very common situation you've you you're selling something this is when a lot of philanthropy happens um uh, and you um, you have $10 million of a gift because that's what you want to do. Um, and and you you um, uh, and you and you're doing it. So just setting up annual income of four hundred thousand dollars. What would happen in this situation? The next slide uh, would be if this happens in 2023, no effect at all. In 2024, three million. $182,085 of AMT will be applicable, okay? Uh, that's just the federal part. If you add provincial part, again, depending on the numbers, the AMT bill will go to 4 to $5 million, okay? Um, uh, this example is a traditional example of someone having a big gain, having blessings, and then setting up a, a foundation, giving that big gift to the university or hospital. This is a typical situation in Canada where an individual has such a, a, a beautiful gain and says, oh, I'm giving back to society. I want to take advantage of the tax rules. Yes. Here you have a situation with perhaps $5 million of AMT. Uh, will this be recovered in seven years? Doubtful very much of it will be recovered. Maybe 20% of it will be recovered. Um, uh, and the rest will be lost. Uh, so what will this person do this next year? Who knows? You know, will they reduce the gift? Probably um, uh, on this. Next example. Uh, a woman, um, uh, this was uh, someone reporting from in Ontario of a woman wishing to donate an apartment building. And we're just saying to a low cost housing charity um, uh, for use. Uh, by them and it's 
and the value of the apartment building is $5 million, cost base a million, undepreciated capital cost $400,000. Why is the person doing it? Person's of an age, doesn't need the money, doesn't need it, doesn't need the complexity. Just give it away type of thing. It's time. I want to give it away um, and, and help society. I'm not overly worried about tax effects. Uh, in, in, in the situation, she has other income pensions of 400,000. She makes other donations of $50,000 in the year. Um, what, you know, her profile is, yeah, I, I want to give it away. You know, I, I don't want to, you know, what, what, what's going to happen here is my receipt, normal receipt of $5 million. There'll be gains here because you're, you're giving real estate, the uh, cost base, you're, you're going to have a capital gain, you're going to have recapture. Yeah, I want my receipt to uh, apply against those gains. So I'm not paying tax by, by, by giving this away. They, and the receipt will then be used against my other income. Okay. And probably be usable over many years type of thing. Cause she can't use the receipt all, all, uh, all in one year. What's the result in this case of her just saying, giving up an apartment um, is that she will have in 2023, if this happens this year, no effect, but in 2024, There'll be five hundred thousand dollars of AMT. Uh, add the provincial component. Let's assume it's seven hundred fifty thousand in total. So here it is, just giving away an asset, not caring really about making a, a, a big tax score on it, but just saying, "I'm giving it away. I want. I don't want to pay tax on it." We'll now have to dip into her resources, okay, of perhaps seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and pay a tax bill. Uh, it is recoverable over seven years. Doubtful in her situation, she'll be able to recover all of this over seven years. Maybe half um, will be there. And so that's there. Now, there, there was a major gift um, uh, to uh, Winnipeg Community Foundation this year of a half a billion dollars. And um, again, it was a gift of, of, uh, of preferred chairs like this, where you create a gain. Um, uh, would AMT affect that one? No, because it happened on death. So what will happen is in these situations is probably the person's going to say when they're told by the accountant, everyone, look, you're going to have tax liability and everything is say, you know what, let's wait until I pass away to do it. So you're going to have deferrals of, uh, of these kind of gifts where an elderly person in doing their estate planning and doing their, their, their giving planning says, let's start doing it. They will wait until death when AMT does not apply uh, to make such a gift. The, the, next, um, uh, the next one in this, uh, in this one is, again, the same sort of person, uh, state planning, um, uh, again, like that gift to the Winnipeg Foundation, owns preferred shares of Company C, um, and wants to donate the shares to, to the hospital. After the donation, the shares will be redeemed for cash, so the hospital will get cash. And and it's part of his estate planning. Okay, what am I doing with my assets? Doing his will, doing his what I'm giving to the children, and saying no, I want to uh, give make this major gift to the hospital. And okay, uh, it seems it's best to donate my preferred shares of the company as a best gift to do. Uh, we're going to cover this in a future Pear Tree Summit seminar in the first uh, in the next few weeks. Um, and all of a sudden here, yes, there's a capital gain created. Uh, the value is $4 million. There's a capital gain created. Other income the person has is $300,000. So when we, we look at this and just say, okay, uh, what's going to happen here? In 2023, no AMT. In 2024, $476,335 of AMT. Add the provincial component. Maybe AMT is now $700,000. And um, will be able to recover, probably not so quickly. Uh, and again, here in looking at the person's estate planning and what to do, we'll probably say, uh, you know what, let's just uh, do this on death um, uh, uh, or or some other, uh, some or reduce the gift um, uh, to, to fit in better. And that's probably the results. So that's our four horsemen. I'm just going to add a, a five horsemen. Uh, it's, that's the, the donor to the uh, mining flow throughs. And, and uh, so just to say, it's not, you know, an, an, uh, you know, an, an event that's terrible. As Ron points out, 
that probably there'll be 60 to 65 percent of the activity from before so that if uh, uh if last year there was a billion dollars of exploration done through this mechanism and 350 million of of uh charity done through it well maybe there'll be only 225 million of charity done and that's uh, uh, an effect not on universities, but a lot of that money goes into donor advised funds and they get spread out to smaller organizations. That's my history with that. And so that will have an effect on on uh, uh, on, on giving in, in Canada. Um, and those are my five horsemen of the AMT. Thank you. So Troy, uh, it's I think I think you're up. Um, Perfect. Thank you, Bobby. Brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending. As as Ron pointed out, I'm I'm kind of at the intersection of AMT and philanthropy because I'm a charity lawyer who works work with a lot of charities, but I'm also working in the area of private wealth, so private planning for succession planning and transfer of wealth and all of that stuff. So it's right at the intersection of uh, the interaction of AMT with philanthropy. So I want to give a little bit of a history of AMT, a summary of what it is. I think it's always important as, by way of reminder. Um, and then how the, some of the changes that are going to be brought about the AMT and some comments of what you can do or should do. I always like to give a little bit of a introduction of what I'm going to talk about for those of you who like to see a bit of an agenda. So what is the AMT? The, length, the name itself is an acronym for Alternative Minimum Tax. Um, so essentially, under the Income Tax Act, there are two streams or two methodologies of calculating. So the regular calculation for absolutely everybody. And at the same time, you've got the calculation of the AMT, and this happens kind of automatically when we're doing our taxes. Um, so the AMT itself is alternative, even though it kind of runs parallel to the ordinary tax. And it resulted, it, it was introduced in the mid eighties from a perceived unfairness because higher earners were able to use tax preferences that were contained in the Income Tax Act to lower their tax burden. Now, I use the word tax preferences on purpose because, remember, the legislature put these things in the Income Tax Act. They said, we want to have these tax preferences, whether it's a credit or a deduction, because we think this is beneficial for whatever goals, societal goals, beneficial goals. So it's really, if certain uh, earners are able to use those preferences, which are laid out by Parliament. They resulted in a perceived unfairness. So following the lead, perhaps, of the U.S., in the 1980s, the government introduced um, the, the AMT. So we can go to the next slide. So how was it calculated? So very quickly, it's relatively straightforward to understand, even if the mechanics of it is, uh, can be a little tricky. Um, so basically what you do is you calculate your regular tax on this column, then you calculate what the AMT would be, and you figure out which one is higher, then you pay it. So let's look at a little bit of the mechanics. So you got your regular tax with your regular deductions and credits. On this side, AMT, whatever your income is, you're entitled to a deduction of $40,000 from the adjusted taxable income. So this is that present, remember. Um, then when you finish your calculation with all of removing all of those deductions that you're entitled to and you add all that back in, you apply a rate of 15% in addition to the provincial rates. As Bobby pointed out, there's federal tax, then there's provincial rates totaling approximately 20 to 25%. And then when you have that, you're entitled to certain deductions, and we'll get into a few of those, which are key in the philanthropic sector today. Um, but they're far less than the ordinary rules. The idea is you're adding, a, you're removing the ability to, to use those tax preferences to come up with a different calculation. So again, you got your column A with your regular tax, you got your column B with your AMT. If the AMT tax is higher than your ordinary tax, you pay the excess, I mean, you pay the AMT. Right, you pay that, that the tax, but there's that carry forward of seven years, as Bobby pointed out, which is not really necessarily applicable because you've got to fall below the AMT threshold. 
then you can carry forward for seven years the excess of the differential. So if you're paying, you take AMT tax, you minus the regular tax, you can carry that amount forward as a credit. Not a lot of people are necessarily going to be able to take advantage of that. So really, really that's the mechanism of the AMT. Now, if we go to the next slide, we're going to look at some of the adjustments of things that are denied that are kind of added back in. Now, these are some, there are others. And the reason I wanted to, to, to have this slide is so that you can get an idea of the kind of tax preferences that the AMT doesn't allow to use. So certain losses for capital cost allowance, resource deductions, capital gains over uh, capital losses. Um, so you can see that these are some of the lists of things that are that throw you back in, you, you, you can deduct it under the regular, but you have to add it back in in your AMT calculation. So if we go to the next slide, this is where, where it gets interesting and relevant. So what are the per permitted deductions today before Gen 1, 2024? So 30% of a business investment losses for the year, that's a nice one, dividend gross up. But for philanthropy-minded people, you can use your donation tax credits under the regular AMT, which you, you donate, you can get a credit, you can use it against your tax payable. You're allowed that under the present AMT. And very important, which is a very, very useful mechanism for charities to raise money, is when you donate capital, uh, donate publicly listed securities to a charity, you there's zero or nil capital gains inclusion. So you get the full credit, use it according to the regular rules and no capital gains inclusion. And that's a key one. That's a key one that is going to change in the philanthropy area under the AMT. So, and then you can also, there's some credits that are excluded um, um, under the AMT. Some, like I said, some some you're allowed, but some are, are excluded. I put those in there by way of example. So if we move ahead to the next slide, we'll talk about the 2023 budget change. And I'm just focusing on a few of them. There are many other changes to the AMT, the, the broadening of the base, which is really a broadening or a further limitation of those tax preferences. Parliament says here are tax preferences. Parliament is saying with AMT, we are going to limit the use of those tax preferences that we've introduced. Um, so we'll go through a couple. There were there were many others, but I think these are the key ones that for for the audience today. Um, the adding thirty percent of capital gains and donations of publicly listed securities, which under the regular rules of present AMT, it's nil, and under the regular rules will stay nil. But for the AMT, they're including in a thirty percent capital uh, capital gains on those donations, um, and only. 50% of the donation tax credit under the new AMT will be allowed, even including cash donations. So the previous AMT, you could you know, use the full donation tax credit to the limits permitted. Um, now it's only 50%. So they're reducing the ability of using the donation tax credit in AMT, which is which is a little shocking for someone who practices in the in this space. Um, they're increasing the capital gains inclusion rate, inclusion rate from 80% to 100% for AMT purposes for regular capital gains, um, including 100% of the benefits associated with employee stock options, which under the regular rules are 50%. But what is also key is the raising the rate of AMT from that 15% to 20.5%. And remember, that's the federal rate only. You also have to add in the provincial tax. So we're going from a differential of say 20 to 25% to minimum 32, which could be a bit higher. So the rate is, is, is much higher um, than previously. So that's a, that's a snapshot. I know it's a quick snapshot. The goal is not to, for everybody to become experts in AMT, um, but really to get a sense of what they're doing with these tax preferences. And in particular, when it comes to the philanthropy side of, of the capital gains in inclusion for those public listed securities and also the limitation of the donation tax credit. Um, because remember, you're giving stuff away, right? You're giving money away and giving property away. You're getting nothing in return than a receipt and goodwill. And so it's a little startling that they're, that they're, they're behaving this way. So if we go forward one more slide, um, I never like to read um, quotes 
uh, during conference. I prefer much more of an interactive discussion, but I thought this was an interesting one from a professor at the Fraser University, um, uh, uh, Simon Fraser University from March of 2023. And I think it's really interesting and very, very helpful to understand kind of the tinkering and and perhaps the reason why AMT was, was adjusted. So um, the AMT format suffers from additional deficiencies beyond complexity and birth compliance burden, right? There's a lot more. This is where it gets a little wonky, but we'll see, we'll see the end result. So it affects in complex and perhaps I'm going, my editorials unknown ways, how the effective marginal tax rate on various incomes and deduction items, including the computation, will affect various choices, okay? So what does that gobbledygook mean? Well, the result is that certain tax incentives such as resource flow through shares, donations, um, will be blunted, right? It might be, would it have been preferable to deal with the limitations in more street, more specific manners rather than tinkering with this broad AMT? This is what I find really helpful from this author. And it's not just my editorial comment. Often the AMT is justified as a feasible way to satisfy the political imperative for optics that persons at high wealth are paying sufficient tax. And, and my editorial comment is I think the optics are key. So just look at quickly at a couple of the numbers. 1998, 25.8 of tax filers gave to charity. 2021, 17.7% of tax filers gave to charity. So there was a precipitous deduction in overall tax filers. By the way, this came from the Globe and Mail, an article in August of 2023. Um, a precipitous, and perhaps this is due to the, not, the increased tax burden on everybody, also the broadening of the indirect taxation of people just got less money to give, right? The average person has less money to give. But let's look, look at the amount of donations. 1998, 4.3 billion. 2021, 11.8 billion. So even if you adjust for um, inflation dollars, what we're seeing is that larger donations by wealthier Canadians are having that incredible impact on donations. So that's why personally, I find it a bit skewed when we're, we're tinkering with AMT by limiting these donations, when we see that truly it's the wealthy who are the ones who are who are able to give more? Everybody perhaps are philanthropically minded, but it's that ability to give that I think is is impacted. So next slide, please. So what should you consider doing? Contact your accountant or tax advisors, not just to understand what the AMT is, but to have them do the calculation. What is the mathematics for this year, and what's the mathematics for next year? How will your AMT be? What's the dollar figures? What's the percentage? The reason why is because you have to understand the impact on you, on your family, and your philanthropic plan. How is that going to be impacted? And hopefully it won't be negatively impacted. But if it were, you can consider accelerating your philanthropic plan prior to the January 1, 2023, right? One of the options that we that we that we we can often recommend. You heard Bobby talk about donor advised fund. If you have them set up amazing, you can put extra funding in that. If you don't, you can create one. Why is that beneficial to do before Jan 1? Because the old rules apply. If you're not sure how you want your charitable dollars to be used or where to go, putting in a DAF or donor rights fund is brilliant because you can have an element of control to work with the charity that has the funds, how to spend, spend that over time. But you really need to accelerate that if you really want to take advantage of your philanthropic plan without the negative impact that Bobby so, so eloquently and brilliantly pointed out. Um, um, uh, you're right, somebody just pointed out, it should be my apologies, Jan 1, 2024, excellent capture, uh, December 31st, 2023, so 2024, keep that in mind. And contact your member of parliament. I mean, we are, we, we, there's no problem with us calling a member of parliament and say, hey, we, we need to, this isn't gonna impact me, here's my dollar figure, please understand what this is doing. Um, and that could be excellent and, and very helpful um, uh, for them to understand and put pressure on them, you know, call, call your member of parliament. Very quickly, the last slide, the next slide, please. Um, is and this is going to be some of the the the, the, the kind of like the 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 behind the scenes the, the 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 you know the pot stirring things that some of the tax people can do. This is not a tax advice, but a suggestion of some of the ways that, that you can think and bring to the table with your advisors. Like I said, consider accelerating your taxable income in two thousand twenty three, prior to two thousand twenty four. 
and that will allow you to take advantage to the maximum degree of these these credits and the in capital gains inclusion. Um, you can, if you're looking for liquidity, you can consider withdrawing your from your RIF, your RSP for purchasing flow through shares or making cash donations. Yes, it's an income inclusion, but you got your credit and it allows you to fund your DAF and do those kinds of really great things. Um, when it comes to CDA, CDA is a very useful tool that a lot of people can use in their private in their holding company, the CCPCs. Um, a lot of times you, you'll, you'll get it and then you'll lend it back to the company interest just to keep the cash going in your company, that kind of, you don't really need it, but consider having an interest bearing loan rather than the non-interest bearing loan. Have your company pay the interest that allows the CCPC to deduct the interest paid, but gives you cash and liquidity going forward this year and going forward to make those cash donations and, and your um, flow through share purchases. And the last, if you've got a really nice bunch of personally held um, public securities with a nice growth, you're thinking, okay, I would like to plan the donation of that, roll that into your hold co. You can make the donations from your whole co, zero capital gains inclusion. Why? Because companies are not affected by the AMT. You get, so zero capital gains inclusion, you get a really nice job donation for your, um, for your corporation. And you can also actually bump up your CDA from 50% to 100%. So there's really nice things to consider doing there. So these are some very interesting things you can bring to the table with your tax advisors um, to really start to think about how we can do this. Now is the time, make that phone call to your advisors and then get on the phone with your, with your member of parliament to demonstrate how incredible the impact will be on your philanthropy. And collectively, it may be possible to have the government realize that negative impact. So at this point, I will hand it back to Ron. Thanks, Troy. Brilliant. And if we can have Brian join us now. Brian, you're the ultimate finance insider. We'll try. Uh, where are you? Yeah. There you are. Great. Uh, 35 years with finance. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for making yourself available. This is great. So just maybe we have a general question just as we lead in. So what were they thinking and who's they? Are, is it the politicians, the department view of reducing the availability of, of donation tax credits or, or flow through share um, uh, deductions and, and credits? So who's they and what were they thinking? All right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. And, and thank you very much for including me in this. Yes. Uh, I sort of stumble in saying it, but I did spend 35 years at finance, which actually means that uh, I was there in '85 when the when the AMT was first developed, and uh, uh, sort of and sort of had a window on it then, and as well as from the outside, but uh, uh, a window on it uh, that the changes today. I guess the first point I'll make, and I, I'm I'm going to answer your question, Ron, but is that I think that we what we're seeing now is history repeating itself. Um, in the '84 federal election campaign. As far as I can tell from looking back, from my recollection, but also looking back at the tape, is that in the midst of a televised debate between the three major party leaders at the time, it appeared that the NDP's Ed Broadbent was scoring some points and suggesting that certain high-income taxpayers weren't paying sufficient tax. And in response during that debate, Brian Mulroney set the stage for the introduction of a personal minimum tax in Canada when he said, and I, I agree with Troy that giving quotes is not the best thing, but there are a couple of short ones I'd like to, to, to recount. Mr. Mulroney said, I think it's unfair that an individual not pay a minimum tax. Should anybody in this country of wealth and substance not pay tax? The answer is no. Yes, he should pay tax and it should be a handsome tax. And with the Conservatives election in the 1984 campaign, that led directly to the introduction of the AMT in, in 1986. Now, if we fast forward to the 2021 election, and perhaps with a similar influence by the NDP's positioning on this, under the heading of making sure everyone pays their fair share, the Liberal platform proposed, and here's a quote, create a minimum tax rule so that everyone who earns enough to qualify for the top tax bracket pays at least 15% each year, removing their ability to artificially pay no tax through excessive use of deductions and credits. And of course, we now have in the last budget some major tightening changes proposed to the AMT, which we're, which we're talking about here today. The first point I want to make is that a minimum tax may or may not be good tax policy. I, I tend to the view it's not, simply on the basis that if there are things in the regular income tax base that aren't appropriate, change that. 
And if, if the regular income tax base is fine, then there's no reason to create an alternative base. But good policy or not, it's clearly appeared to be a politically attractive proposition at different times to all three major political parties in Canada. And, and not just in Canada, as Troy's mentioned, the uh, US of course has dabbled with personal and corporate minimum taxes as well. The second point I'd like to make at the outset is that notwithstanding the political rhetoric that, you know, the references to artificially paying no tax, for example, it, it, there really is no great mystery as to how some high income taxpayers end up paying lower rates of tax. Some work I did with Alex Laurent at the C.D. Howe Institute before the budget indicated that capital gains were the primary reason that most high income earners paid less tax, either because they were farmers or small business owners qualifying for the lifetime capital gains exemption on the sale or the business, or most of their income represented taxable capital gains for which the regular federal tax rate tops out at just above the 15% tax rate that the AMT um, was set at and, and which the 2020 election, 2021 election platform suggested was too low for taxpayers. It, it appeared to us from, from research that I have to give most of the credit to Alex and his colleagues too, that capital gains explained about 70% of the cases in which high income earners paid lower taxes. And the other provisions, pretty standard and generally well accepted tax provisions, explain much of the rest. RSP contributions, charitable donations, incurred losses, stock option benefits, and the dividend tax credit. To wind up, I'll say, say that I make this point for two reasons. First, just to emphasize that the perception that sophisticated and perhaps what some would call edgy tax planning is not what's responsible for high income taxpayers, for most high income taxpayers paying lower tax rates. It's the provisions I mentioned. And the second point is to suggest that given what I'll call garden variety tax provisions are the main reason for even some higher income taxpayers facing lower rates, the only way in which the government's 2021 commitment could have been met was to tighten the AMT by effectively constraining the application of those same provisions, which is what the last budget did as Troy re recounted, doing things like increasing the capital tax gains tax rate above the ordinary personal tax rate, reducing the benefit of the charitable donations tax credit, limiting the deductibility of interest expense and loss carryovers, et cetera. So uh, when to sort of cl close and answer your question, Ron, it seems to me that uh, it's actually a political exercise rather than sort of a tax policy exercise that's really informed the, the 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 institution or introduction of the AMT nearly 40 years ago and it's tightening today. Uh, thanks, thanks, Brian. Um, so it, it's your just not to put you on the spot, but so it's your view that that these changes um, in this long, relatively not, not uber long, but a fairly long laundry list of addbacks into AMT, including donation tax credits and exploration expenses, mm -hmm. were were intentional. Do you think they were? They, certainly, what you 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 refer to the donation tax credit. What about the exploration, the the incentives that? that uh, drive uh, exploration activity in Canada, uh, as, and especially in light of the, the, the huge success of the 2023 Critical Mineral Exploration Tax Credit, yeah. which yeah. resulted in $350 million of accretive investment over 12 months post that, that, that introduction of that credit. We did 225 of that. So we saw the impact up from virtually nothing the year before. Do you think that was also intentional? Well, Yes, and possibly, I guess, is a summary of what I'm about to do, uh, elaborate on. Um, in terms of charitable donations and the impact, I think the tax policy branch of the Department of Finance that I know would certainly have understood that the charitable donations tax credit was among the personal tax credits that they were proposing or that the budget was proposing to limit for AMT purposes to only half of the regular value. Uh, I, I, I just can't believe otherwise on that score. And I think that it would have been understood and been briefed on to, to the polit political level that the limit on charitable donations relief alongside the capital gains changes and the, the higher AMT rate collectively would reduce the benefit of, of charitable donations in, in, in some cases. I, I'm less certain on whether or not the impact of the AMT changes on flow through shares would have been specifically evaluated, uh, possibly, but, but also possibly not. And so it, it, it does seem, it follows from that, I think, that it's possible that even if the minister and their officials had fully understood that they were muting in some respects the incentive for charitable donations generally, they may not have appreciated the potential impact, potential impact 
on flow through shares and 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 that, that that could be at odds with another current and as you say very important policy objective of incenting mineral exploration and development and particularly the exploration and development of, of critical minerals so there, there's room there to uh to lobby government um can you explain while we're just talking about um, uh, just pulling things out of the of, of this legislation. Can you explain? Maybe can, can we have your thinking with respect to the to the limitation on carry forward? So, for example, if one were to lose a million dollars in the stock market this year and have a, a capital loss carry forward of a million dollars, and then next year uh, have a capital gain of a million dollars under the current rules, that's a wash. And we would uh, not be paying any tax, but in next year we can only carry forward half of that, so we're still paying about one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in tax, even though we have a loss to shelter it. Can you can you can you sort of speak to that, you know, that issue? And and have you had any line of sight from like the TSX or otherwise in terms of why isn't Bay Street and investors generally why aren't they all clamoring for a change? Well, Maybe answering that kind of something, mm -hmm. something you can't speak to, but the first one I'd like you to speak to at least. Yeah, I, 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 I can't speak really to the second one, but I, but I will offer the comment that part of the, the um, conundrum with an AMT is that its effects are kind of opaque. Um, it, it, it can, as the examples that uh, uh, Bobby raised earlier can show, have, have dramatic impacts. But it's it's possible that with a combination of the, those that, that fact pattern and higher ultra, other other higher income, uh, current year AMT Im impacts are, 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 are more muted. It's also possible that it's recoverable in, in future years. And so that kind of uh, clouds the discussion or analysis of, of what the actual impact will be as a generalization, but, but even sometimes in particular cases, because you don't know what the, the income levels will be going, going forward. Um, on the point of losses, I mean, I recognize that the AMT already has some limits in, in relation to losses. You know, they're entitled to, you know, for film tax shelters or, or some exploration to expenses, um, deduct the costs up to the, the income otherwise generated for the same year. So there are limits there. But the more general, I don't like using the word attack, but, but sort of challenge of, of the use of losses for AMT, and I'll include interest expense in this as well, um, seems to me inappropriate the the uh i think the the measure so an income tax is by definition a tax on income not on, on gross revenues or something between gross revenues and you can i, I guess while i challenge the sort of the the efficacy and, and perhaps propriety of a, of a minimum tax in any case an alternative in, income tax base in any case suggesting that if you you either have the right regular income tax base or change it. Um, it. It seems to me not not quite cricket, if I could put it that way, to uh, to to limit losses or limit expenses um, that that uh, are otherwise recognized as legitimate income earning expenses. And it seems to me even sort of more curious, if I could sort of use a mild term, that you know losses that you might be able to use in the same years in which you generate income or capital losses that you were able to use even for AMT purposes in the same year in which you recognize a capital gain are somehow constrained when it's a carryover from another year. That's just almost random in its, in its impact and application to taxpayers, depending on whether or not they're realizing these gains and losses or income and losses in the same year or in different years. So I, I do have a lot of trouble and, and struggle quite a lot with the uh, uh, with, with these particular changes. I have one last question before putting it over to, to Troy and Bobby and perhaps raising a couple of other questions that, that, have, been, that have been raised by participants this morning. But do you, uh, you know, one of the comments that Troy made in terms of uh, tax planning is to take your 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 public list securities and roll if you have a hold co that earns income, hold it, you know, roll roll it over into your hold co and then use the CCPC typically to make the donation and add to the capital dividend account because CCPCs are not subject to AMT. Um, do you see this as a uh, as a first step in taxing private corporations? Well, it's it's a fair question, I think. Eh? The um, I, I haven't I haven't I confess to not having spent enough time on it yet. We're still trying to figure out, uh, as as many are the the sort of the application is under the proposals that they put forward. But but obviously um, planning, and I and I subscribe to uh, Troy's comments about about uh, you know considering uh, 
ways to try to mitigate and moderate the application of the AMT, including the use of, of CCPCs. Um, e even the day of the budget, uh, I was in the budget lockup, we were discussing, some of us were discussing whether the AMT changes were so significant, so impactful, uh, that they might actually drive some to consider the use of private companies in order to uh, avoid or limit uh, some of the AM, AM, AMT effects. And if that were to become a widespread development, you can imagine a possible government reaction uh, being to extend the AMT to private companies. That, in my mind, is sort of opens up another comment I'll make, it, and that is that um, effectively the AMT is changing things. Um, you know, the the to, to take an example of capital gains, which I think is the the easiest and perhaps most pronounced uh, exact case. Um, you know, capital gains. Maximum tax rate on capital gains today under the personal income tax system is 16 federally is 16 and a half percent, one half of the top personal tax rate of 33 percent because there's only a 50 percent inclusion rate. Well, the AMT has now moved that, ca that capital gains tax rate up to 20.5 percent because of the 100 percent inclusion of capital gains, not donations of listed securities, just, just regular capital gains. One way to look at that is, is it's, it's kind of the equivalent at the margin um, for, for increasing the equivalent of increasing the capital gains inclusion rate from 50% to about 62%. And you can, if, if that were the proposition being put forward, there might be a much more pronounced reaction to it, but I think probably a better discussion around it because it would be more transparent. The opaqueness of doing it through the AMT may help the government in actually getting it through, may sort of explain the, sort of this kind of lack of reaction that you've, you flagged Ron, but but I, I think we ought to be having a more deliberate discussion about the AMT effects on capital gains, the AMT effects on donations, et cetera, today, because they're, because they're really happening under these proposals today, rather than say um, in a few years time, if and when the government says, well, the AMT is being avoided through use of private corporations, so now we're going to extend capital gains or AMT to, to private companies or change the capital gains rate more generally, because in effect, it's already been moved up by the AMT, uh, by the AMT itself. So there's a lot of different threads here, I think, and uh, uh, I don't have the answer to them all, but but it does seem to me that this all deserves more discussion than it's getting. Yeah, the, the problem with AMT is that, yep. sorry, Bobby, go on. I, I think I've, I've, I've exhausted, I mean, I, I could continue asking questions for like another four hours, but go on. If I, if I could jump in on the moving of listed securities to a holding company, which I think is a valid point, especially the way Troy said it, you do it now for the future type of thing. Um, you know, uh, along with th this budget change on AMT, there are another budget change in relation to general anti-avoidance rules mm. and uh in those changes which is this general thing that says hey if you're if you do nasty stuff to save tax we can reverse it and they've extended that ability for gar now in the budget and law now to a bigger sp scope it, it yeah if you're if you're doing it nasty that's yeah it wasn't your full intention but partial intention one of your intentions was to be nasty but you have other good intentions now we we can still apply GAR. And I'm saying this because when we've looked at, call it gift planning, in which we've tried to, um, you know, do the best for, for the donor, um, someone would always could say, hey, is this garable? And you'd say, hey, yeah, you, no, the main reason we're doing this is charity. And I'm going to come back to this. And so therefore, yeah, if we're doing it in the most tax effective manner, yeah, okay, that's allowed under the law, but we're doing this for charity. Now with the changes in GAR, I, I'm not saying it apply, but if that example I had with the, the techie, okay, and all of a sudden that, that deal, which was happened to happen in November, happens in January. And so the day before the deal, Okay, he takes those marketable securities and he puts them into his holding company. And then the sale happens afterwards. There's going to be practitioners that are going to say, hold on a second. Is that garble now under this new sort of rules, which extend it? I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's not. But it's going to create. So there, there's going to be uncertainty. There's going to be. And whenever there's uncertainty, you know, people don't do things because when we're talking about charity, 
you know, we're getting money from the wealthy, right? And this nefarious wealthy that are, we're transferring money from the wealthy to society's good, okay? Uh, they're poorer. They take the, the tax advantages. They're poorer afterwards. Let them be poorer. Let them do this. And using incentives in the Income Tax Act, proper incentives to do it. So it's this nefarious thing is we got to get them to pay the right, the right amount of tax and the right things. What they're doing, and it's a political issue, is they're deciding effectively where their tax dollars are going by giving to charity. We all do that in our democracy type of thing here. And this is what's under attack here um, uh, is, is, yeah, most donations in Canada, percentage wise, comes from wealthy. That will continue. AMT will affect some of it. Okay, it's not getting rid of everything. It's not getting rid of mining flow throughs. It's not getting rid of major gifts. Some of it will be affected. And but the reality is, anyone doing those, uh, anyone doing those, are not getting richer by doing uh, uh, charity. AMT, you're you're buying sh shelters. The reason you're buying shelters is to become wealthier in a sense. Um, you know, interest expense or other. Whatever you're doing, it's for you. You're attacking charities now. Uh, the charity, if, you, if you're disincentivizing, and that's what this will do. If you're creating a consternation in people's minds about whether they should do something because of these effects and they don't do it, you're disincentivizing. All you're doing is making the tax coffers greater, making the wealthier still wealthier because they're, they're not giving up their largest, and the charities society is suffering and that's there's a there's something here that we have to change in our governance perception now or where yeah they have to have thought that, that we're, we're we're affecting charitable donations here uh, and i think that's that's a big error on behalf of government so so if ron if i may just to follow up yeah. on bobby's point is um you know I call them tax preferences because the income tax is littered, shouldn't say littered, that's not appropriate, is, is full of preferences to encourage or discourage. But oftentimes the preferences are there to encourage certain types of behaviors. So in the flow through area, those that money that goes in allows for exploration of things that maybe there otherwise wouldn't be as much money available. That's a tax preference that is beneficial. When it comes to the AMT, you know, it's a, it's a policy debate about whether people are paying their fair share or not. That that's one policy debate. But I think something that Bobby pointed out that is to me as a practitioner in this area that is so sort of shocking and that really was a punch in the face when I saw it is the reduction of those tax credits and that use of tax credits for charitable donations because it is not as if you know it's almost as if the tax Authority, the, the government is saying we're a better place to spend money. Well, let me give an example of where government is using charity because they know that char what charities do is such incredible work in society. To pick up on Bobby's point, there were two amounts, of, two funds that were publicly created, and this is all this is all out there in the in the the public sphere. So one is called the Healthy Communities Initiative, was just sixty million dollars as a result of COVID to help communities and community-based organizations, very small grassroots charities and not-for-profits to have an impact on their communities. What did the government do? The government knew of Canada knew the best way to get money to the people to do good things is by small charities and grassroots. So they partnered with the larger charities to funnel this money because they knew they are the ones who could do it best. They're the ones who could deliver the best bang for the buck. Fast forward, I think a year or two, it's something called the Healthy Community Initiative. One time grant of $400 million to four to three charities and that they are going to run these programs in the communities. And get, again, getting to grassroots and small communities. The, the government is saying, you are best placed to do this work because you are best at doing this work. We will partner with you to get money to where it's got to go. And on the other hand, they're saying, but then we're going to limit the ability to make donations. So as Bobby pointed out, it's not going to stop philanthropy, but it could have any chilling or any negative impact on philanthropy runs truly counter to what the reality is on the street and to what the government is doing on the other hand. So, you know, one of, one of the points to, you know, I say, speak to your member of parliament. 
you can you can make changes and make movements and find it's a wealthy person saying I'm giving a lot why you're doing this because the consequences of what they're doing can have a chilling effect on the actual delivery of those services that are so crucial to society and to me it's quite telling on the one hand they're saying oh we're going to limit it the other hand we're saying let's use them to deliver the services because they are best place to do it it's to me to me there's there's a complete disconnect um let me um, let me brian were you about to say something i i, I can comment on a couple of those things if you would like sure. yeah, yeah fine. um so my my one i realize uh lack of foresight and re getting ready for today was failing to bring a pen with me to make some notes. Um, but um, uh, I'll try to I'll try to cover at least a couple of things. First to Bobby's point. Yes, thank you. I'll, maybe I get you right down and hold it up to the screen. Um, I'll fax it. To I'll Bobby's, fax it to, you. To, 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 <laughs> uh, to Bobby's point on, on GAR, I guess, yes, I think it is relevant. I, I would argue, and this is not legal advice, and I haven't really thought extensively about it, but my immediate reaction to the point is that in respect of the flow through share structure and the flow through share structure in combination with charitable donations, I, I would find it difficult to conclude that uh, the government would have a case to, to support GAR in that context. There's been a lot of ink spilled on all aspects of that, including a 2011 budget change, which, which, which constrained the benefits in some respect. And so I think that the government's policy with respect to that is, is pretty clear. And, and ought not to be subject to to challenge even with the guard changes. I do allow the that the more consideration has to be given to something like the the example of, of transferring shares into a corporation, a private company in order to uh, uh, avoid the application of AMT. I mean, it, it does seem to be uh, fall into the at least the broader definition uh, of tax avoidance transaction. You know, one of the main purposes was to was to to achieve a tax benefit, and so that that that's a potential concern and and and, and needs more analysis. Um, on the uh, the point about uh, the the impact on this of charitable donations and and in combination with flow through shares on on investment in the resource sector, uh, I think that it's important to for for those that want to. Um, pursue those to, 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 to try their best to explain to the department how much impact that, ha that has. As I said, I, I'm quite certain that the department's aware of the, uh, what they've done or, and the minister was made aware of, of the broad, in broad strokes of the impact of the effect of the AMT changes with respect to charitable donations writ large. It's not, I'm not as certain, I just don't know. This is all speculative on my part, but, but, uh, um, but, but I, I'm less certain of them being as focused on on the application with respect to to flow through shares per se so there's 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 an educational aspect to to trying to, to to have a discussion with them a challenge here and i've made this comment when i was when i used to be in in government is that charitable donation in some sense is already irrational you're giving something up it is a gift and so uh, sort of at a very kind of hard nose level you're you're not doing it on an economic economically rational basis so if the if the tax system provides a benefit of, of 50 cents or 60 cents for a donation today, you're still out the, the 50 cents or 40 cents. Um, so, so now change the math and so that the, the tax system provides 10 cents less benefit. It's, it's a tough, it, it's kind of hard to prove either way if that's going to have an impact. It makes sense that a lower incentive is going to produce less as I think I've shared with you in a call we had before for today. I mean, there's this maxim that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, if you want more of something, subsidize it. If you want something less of something, tax it. Well, effectively, you're reducing the subsidy or increasing the tax uh, with what the changes are here. So it makes sense that there would be less charitable donations, that there would be less flow through share investment. Um, but but I, I think you really have to have a discussion with with finance about that, and, and I think you have to try to do your best in what won't be absolutely demonstrable uh, to, to to show what you think the what reasonably think the the impact will be. Let me uh, suggest one thing, and and to to Troy's point as well about about you know running your numbers and saying you know this year I gave away a hundred thousand dollars, next year I can only give away fifty thousand dollars. A personalized, real life uh, example presented to your member of parliament that says I'm going to give away thirty thousand dollars less next year to charity to to the local hospital. Is the government going to step up and subsidize that thirty thousand dollars that I'm otherwise going to give away because? 
when I run my numbers, I'm not going to give away that I'm, my hundred is going to turn into, into 70. So personalizing the discussion as opposed to broad brush stroke is a, is a very good exact, is a very good reason for, is a, is a very good exercise. The other thing is, I think in the philanthropic community, and I like to talk about the, the mining community for a moment, but in the philanthropic community, I think the real pain is going to be felt in the first quarter of 2025. Because none of us, including those who have tax as a hobby, uh, bother running stuff until their income tax returns are prepared generally and not until the income tax uh, uh, returns are prepared in the, in, the, in the following spring. And someone is going to sit down with, with, with uh, his or her accountant and she's going to say, you know, that $100,000 or that $50,000 donation that you made. Well, um, you also had some loss carry for you, you had some interest expense, you were in a limited partnership, you bought a you know, whatever. And in fact, you can't use it. And now the now the the fundraiser calls in you know beginning of of, of next of, of 2025, um, or or you know in the in the first quarter because the year ends of all the hospitals, for example, are March 31. And they say, you know, your annual pledge of 50 can, you know, or a hundred, are you are you good for it? And the answer, my guess would be, well, I have a problem. I can't make use of all the deductions. Why don't I give you a half now? We'll talk later. And I think there's going to be significant re reduction. And I think Troy, you had cited a number in an earlier conversation about how much has AMT actually collected over the years. And mm -hmm. relative to that collection, it seems like you know to to increase that number isn't going to add a lot, and the the, the disincentives are going to be um, 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 are going to be orders of magnitude higher. Yeah, and I, I saw one one article and and look at, you know calculating because because one of the things sort of on to pick up on Brian's thread is there was you know some that when I use the word optics it was it was on purpose and again this is my commentary I'm not imparting anything to Brian but the optics of it where the AMT they were looking at we had lots of discussions about what are we going to do with capital gains should we increase the inclusion rate for everybody should we get rid of it for personal houses so I think there was a lot of pressure in the 2000 2020 2021 and the AMT probably fell out fell in there to say hey let's get those people who are just escaping all the things so optic plays a role and I saw one number was something shockingly low something like 200 million a year or some very don't quote me on that because I'm I'm you know but Ron I did in fact read that and it was kind of startling to say that they're going to tinker with a mechanism that is not particularly successful but that can have this chilling effect on behaviors that are unattended and unthought about consequences. It's not a it's not a well crafted or, or a way of dealing with things. If there is a misuse of a preference, that's one thing. But it seems to be there a blanket approach. And again, it goes back to why on earth would you affect charitable donations? It's not as if I earn this income and I can lower the tax payable. It's fundamentally I have this and I'm giving it away. It's gone. I've nothing. It's not in my pocket. So I am inherently poorer because I'm giving it away and therefore they're going to make it less beneficial to give it away which again you know I don't understand the the policy behind that um but it's not it, I don't think it's a significant and I don't think it's going to be a significant increase even though the impact could be very chilling in behaviors on one hand and the consequences could be significant but the overall benefit is not necessarily tremendous so the balance it may not have been properly set to have a good, you know, uh, balance and policy with impact. And people will change their behaviors. You know, it's, it's people will change. And sometimes, Rod, just follow one one last point. Sometimes people change their behaviors, and and the impact could be massive when the benefit isn't necessarily so great, right? The, the benefit on one side. So so that and that's what I that's what 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 concerns me greatly of working in this area is is of the true impact on the. On the philanthropic sector, and let me let me speak to the to the mining sector for a moment because and and to the issue of anti avoidance and GAR because in the format that we took to uh, CRA and then Revenue Quebec and uh, Revenue Quebec actually provided an anti avoidance um, uh, ruling. Uh, federal government says if we think it's subject to anti avoidance and it's subject to GAR, we're not going to rule anyway. So we're ruling in your favor, and it's assumed that that we that it's not subject to GAR. Um, the, the new rules expand the ambit of, of, of anti-avoidance. And in our format, recognize what do we do all day long? The joke is we buy high, we donate, we sell low. 
capturing the 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 tax value uh, independent of the economic value, and and the result is stripped of of tax value. Those 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 flow through shares are just common shares, which are then sold globally. And the best example in Quebec that the prime minister has been to is Siona, where you know fifty million dollars was paid for flow through shares by our clients, donated, sold to Australians who paid thirty two million dollars, and you know there that that's that that on first blush all i did was capture tax um uh, tax uh, values although i paid capital gains tax when i when i donated or sold the shares we've had counsel a couple of different firms you know take a scalpel approach to the current gar um and it doesn't uh, it, it it's really our view as as brian indicated as well not a legal opinion i know brian um but that uh that um nor is it the opinion of kpmg um that it's not subject to guard, but in chilling effect, all we need is one auditor in Vancouver, or the same mm. person who's now retired, who also killed the movie industry, to say, I think this is garable, right? And her boss thinks it's garable, and they bring a uh, and 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 they and they bring a guard attack. One auditor, one place in the country, um, represented by an accounting firm, and the accounting firm writes it up. And there goes, you know, talk about chilling effect. People will stop investing in flow through shares. will stop making donations. Um, we have, for those in the mining industry, stops a little strong, obviously, but, you know, it is a concern. Uh, we don't believe it applies, but nobody wants the aggravation. Winning is not necessarily, you know, the end game. It's not being aggravated and, 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 and continuing to, to support the, the exploration. Uh, again, and the, the, the hot button right now is critical minerals. But that said, for those in the mining industry, if you look at our September the 8th uh, submission to finance, it includes a, a, a couple of recommendations in terms of carve outs for flow through shares, uh, including in the, in, the, in the new GAR legislation, a post amble, similar to the reporting rules that say flow through shares are just carved out. Because the reality is flow through shares are almost always bought high and ultimately sold low. In a previous seminar, what I had said is, if you look at the home of the junior mining industry in Canada, which is the TSX Venture, uh, if you, which is, which is, you know, the majority of those issuers are in the exploration. That exploration is, is um, um, venture capital at its riskiest. That every other exchange over the past ten years have done has done remarkably well. Um, in the TSX Venture, it's lost sixty four percent of its value. And it's uh, remarkable that all of the flow through regime does is it risk adjusts an investment in what is otherwise, you know, investment in northern jobs. My deduction in Toronto is has to be offset by a income inclusion in Timmins. And holistically, the flow through regime is is really a, a Canadian finance advantage globally from the Australians who funded 32 million in Siona. Um, the. Um, you know, for them, it's it's thirty two million dollars of invested capital, uh, funding fifty million dollars of direct, you know, um, that direct exploration expenses in the ground. I mean, the rules are very specific on the use of the funds. With these changes, a couple of things will happen. If you use Siona as an example, it might be that instead of thirty two million dollars, we may be asked, you know, you rerun the numbers and you go, it's going to have to be thirty eight million or thirty nine or forty million in order to make use of the deductions and credits in the format. And that may not be sufficient to bridge the valuation gap, the risk reward gap. And so right now we have a great Canadian made only country in the world that has this regime that is giving us a, a, a financing advantage, which hopefully Brian, you're right, now was inadvertently inadvertent and hopefully we can carve out uh, the flow through uh, share regime as, a, as, as subject to both GAR and maybe the, the AMT ad back. But I think the call to action here is speak to your everyone across the board, speak to your members of parliament, recognize uh, that that minimally, you know, you th there's going to be major impacts. How much of this was evidence based versus uh, policy on Twitter, tax the bloody rich, um, and um, and hopefully minimally we get a um, a deferral. We say okay, January one twenty four may not have been the right date. Why don't we put it off till a year while we examine it. Uh, we are in a position, we have full-time GR staff, we are a registered lobbyist, uh, federally and in two provinces, but if anybody needs help in crafting their messages 
uh, just contact us. We're happy to help. We're actually, we do have some, some bullet points that we can distribute to those who want it, but I think it's time to, uh, to pick up the, pick, pick up the ax handle and go, and go knocking or the pitchfork. And I think those of us have to, have to be old enough to understand that that's about Frankenstein. That's not something where the, where the emergency war measures act has to be imposed. Um, anyway, anything else from anyone? We're as usual, we're running a little early, which is great. Um, there are some questions that I think are, that have been raised, but I think they're better answered in email. Some of them are a little wacky, but that's our lives, right? Tax is wacky. <laughs> The only point I might add by closing is, is, is reference to sort of connecting Troy's earlier comments with uh, with the examples that Bowie gave at the top. I think it's really um, interesting. I'm looking for a more precise and evocative term, but I'll say interesting that there's situations where the uh, not dealing with listed securities, but apartment buildings or the like, where you're giving everything you have away to charity and you're ending up with a tax bill. Uh, I think that uh, in terms of getting uh, the attention of people in, in, in Ottawa in relation to um, the sort of the, the overall impact, including in relation to flow through shares, that including those types of example, it can be very powerful and, and uh, compelling. Bobby, you were, you're, you're part of the committee with respect to the uh, submissions made by the uh, Canadian Association of Gift Planners. And I think they are, I think CAGP, are they, are, have they not just um, circulated a, um, uh, a uh, submissions and asking for people's signatures as well? Yeah, so the, the submission has gone to sort of the members charities, which is all, you know, most of the charities in Canada, and asking uh, to support the, the submission by adding your signature uh, and logo to it. And the suggestion is, yeah, you've got you've got the support. Now we'll we'll have support of all of these charities down on paper, and take that paper and visit your local MP, visit your your representative and your you know who, who deal with universities and and government who do with, with with hospitals and all that type of stuff and politics and 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 say this isn't right, and um, and we all believe it's not right. Yeah. Okay, I don't think we have much more. We can be silly and say, Bobby, thank you so much for your four horsemen example. And I think you mentioned earlier that no no horses were hurt or died in the making of those slides. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I don't have much to add. As always, we're a few minutes early. If there's uh, if there is nothing else to add, then I think we're going to close the session. Well, I do have one one last comment and that is this is the fall this is the first of uh, four seminars three more coming um not in this format this is uh, next wednesday and the following two wednesday wednesdays um their webinars are run by bobby um under uh, and he also has a uh, an email address with us called what at, you know bobby climate at pear tree or ask bobby at, at pear tree where we're happy to to um, sponsor Bobby's time in, uh, in answering specific questions on approach. Uh, I once referred to Bobby as the oracle of, uh, of all things philanthropic and giving. I did, that's the last seminar. I think you're more, I think your recipes for donation are more in line with Julia Child. Um, they're really, uh, they're, 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 they're incredibly simple, elegant, on-site policy and very, uh, and, and, and very powerful in giving away more. And it's now the end of September. So we only have a few months to give away more before rules might change on January the 1. Hopefully we're all successful in, in, in pushing that off uh, a bit. Brian, thank you so much for making yourself available. Um, great, uh, Troy, Bobby, fantastic. Laura, thank you very much for putting all this together, Miera, et cetera, on our team. Much appreciated. Um, and thank you to Sonny and Cher for the introductory song and the beat goes on. Because. There we go. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. La da 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 da. La da 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 da. Charleston was once the rage. Uh-huh. And the beat 
goes on, the beat goes on. 